you'll take your Bibles and open to Job chapter 23. We're going to read verses 8 through 12. Then look at chapters 22 and 23. Somebody asked if I was going to be shorter tonight, and I said, I'll be done in time for the business meeting, I promise you. Right before we have the business meeting, I'll be finished. How's that? Job chapter 23, if you'll stand when you find it, we're going to honor God's Word as we read it. I'm just going to read verses 8 through 12 of Job 23. This is Job talking, and Job is in desperation right now. And he says, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doeth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come into your presence, and we thank you for just being able to read your word in a free country. We ask you just to meet with us for a few minutes and take what your word says in these two chapters of Job, and let us just learn from it and be able to apply it to our life. Father, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. By the time we arrive at Job chapter 22, you read Job, and I encourage you as we go through this on Sunday night to go back and just read the 42 chapters of Job in a survey-type manner, just like you would read a, read a novel. You come to chapter 22, Job is a desperate man. He has had a tremendous load that has fallen on him in a short period of time. If Job lived in America, we would say Job had lived the American dream. Job was a, su a successful businessman. Job was, had stature in the community. He was well-respected. Uh, Job had a family that he adored. But in one afternoon, Job was subjected to material devastation. I'd say unlike many that's ever had something like this happen to them before. Job, in one afternoon, lost all of his wealth, and he lost his livelihood. Job was a farmer, and in one afternoon, his entire business was taken away from him. Then Job was subjected in that same afternoon to emotional agony of just losing his children. In a single event, all ten of his children was gone. They was dead. Then Job was put through another attack. Job went through unrelenting bodily misery. The Bible tells us that Job was stricken with a skin disease that the Bible says went from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. His health and his vitality were gone. And Job was uh, exposed to infection, pain, and suffering. And I believe in reading Job that he also lost his wife during this episode. I'm not saying she left him, but I think emotionally she did leave him. Because she said in Job chapter 2, do you still retain your integrity? Just curse God and die. A lot of people want to criticize uh, Miss Job about that, but can you imagine losing all of that in one afternoon? I mean, I've known families who have lost children. And the mother, I have been told, is just like going through life as an amputee. You Never can recover from that. Well, Job said to her, though, he said, Woman, you speak as a foolish person. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And the Bible says in all this, Job didn't sin with his lips. Well, Job, after that happened, had three of his closest comforters come to him. Well, I said comforters, but that's not what happened. Job wasn't comforted. Job goes through a series of conversations with these three people that just rail accusations one after another at Job. And, John, and Job responds to each one of them. And when we get to chapter 22, the conversation ratchets up a little bit. It gets a little bit more heated. When people lose their temper, they get irrational. You ever get irrational? You ever lose your temper and say things and do things and you step back and go, why did I do that for? I had a valuable lesson the other day in Hobby Lobby. I went there to have a, a, a hanger put on the back of a, uh, a picture Angie bought me for Christmas. And I noticed when I walked up, there was probably 75 picture frames sitting on the table. And there was me standing there, and they was working with somebody, and there was a lady over here with the picture frames. And I thought, oh dear, I'm third in line. All I want to do is have a dollar hanger put on the back. A woman got done with this couple, and then she looked at me, and she said, I'll be with you when I'm done with her. And I thought, she has 75 Boiled up inside of me just for a minute. She has 75 picture frames. And then I thought, you know, <clears throat> maybe this is just a good lesson in patience right now. Don't lose my temper. Because I wanted to say, look, I just got a picture frame. All I want is just a sample, you know. And I said, where's the other guy at? And they said, he's back in the back taking care of something. You ever say things that's irrational sometimes? 
There was a woman in Fort Worth, Texas, who ordered shrimp at rice at a restaurant, didn't get enough rice on her, or get, didn't get enough shrimp on her plate. She called 911 mad. <laughs> there was another woman in Fort Pierce, Florida, that went into a McDonald's and ordered chicken nuggets. And they didn't have chicken nuggets, and she called 911 three times as well. They came in, for, in uh, Fort Pierce, Florida and gave her a ticket. And I laugh at stuff like that, but I think, you know what? I've been in situations like that where I've looked like a fool. I step back and I say things and I go, after I get done, oh, I wish I had never said that. Hey, men, do you ever say foolish things to your wives in a fit of rage? You step back and you go, it's a wonder she didn't cold cock me and make me leave the house. It's a wonder she's still with me. Hey, women, do you ever do that same thing to your husbands? Well, we laugh, but we get mad like that. People today don't stop to think about what they're about to say. They just say it. And You know, I'm afraid, I, I don't know, but I'm afraid with the advent of Facebook and email and Twitter and texting and all this stuff, we've lost how that we're supposed to communicate. We'll hide behind a statement, well, I'm just plain spoken. If you don't want to know my opinion, don't ask me. But you know, we need to learn as Christians to temper our conversation. Let me give you two verses. Proverbs 14, verse 29 says, He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Now the NIV, I think, really translates that verse well. It says, Whoever is patient has great understanding, but one that is quick-tempered displays foolishness. Let me give you another verse. Proverbs 18, 13 says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. You ever said something quickly before you had all of the facts? And then as soon as you said that, you learned all the facts and you go, well, I was wrong. You had to not only apologize, but if you was true to your character, you need to stand up and say, I was wrong in that. Well, that, the verse here in Proverbs, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him, has Job's three friends wrapped all through it. They're accusing Job of things they have no business accusing him of because they don't know what's going on. We come to chapter 22, and that's what's happened, and that's what is happening. Eliphaz, who may very well be, I believe, the oldest of his three friends because Eliphaz spoke first, and I believe they had deference to him that he was probably their uh, there was, they, he was their leader when he was speaking. But I think also Eliphaz may have been the wisest because I believe it was Jeremiah that asked the question, is there, any, is there not any more wisdom that's coming out of Timon where Eliphaz was from? Well, Eliphaz is responding to Job from chapter 21, and Job is responding to Zophar in chapter number 20. Zophar just followed the same broad outline that the others have been talking about. He criticized Job in a lengthy tirade about the retribution Job was experiencing because of sin. But he tells Job, he says, Job, God always deals with the wicked people, and he does it quickly. In other words, if somebody sins, God's going to bring judgment on them very quickly. Well, Job responds, and he comes back, and he says back, and he says, I always deal with the wicked in this life. Job chapter 21, verses 7 through 9 says, Job says, wherefore do the wicked live? They become old. Yes, they do, and they're mighty in power. Job says, their seed is established in the sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. Job is saying, the wicked can live to be old people, and there's many wicked people in mighty power. God don't always deal with wickedness when it happens. I'm glad that he don't. Aren't you? I'm glad don't, God don't automatically bring judgment when we sin because he would bring judgment on my life probably routinely. You say, no, Morris, that's not right. Well, let me give you two people who was wicked. Joseph Stalin died at 74 years of age with a stroke, lived a long life. History says Stalin was responsible for the death of as many, of as, many as 40 million people within the borders of the Soviet Union. An evil man. Stalin lived a long life. Let me bring somebody in modern history that died back in December, Kim Jong-il. Died at 70 years, of, uh, 70 years of age. He was a supreme leader of North Korea. And the Human Rights Watch report said that the North Korean government under Kim Jong-il was among the world's most repressive governments in the world. The people had to do what he said or they'd be executed. 
they would be shot by the military in public executions. There's wicked people all around. What, these, what, jo, what Zophar was telling Job is, Job, you've sinned and God has brought punishment on you and it had to be some recent sin. Well, in chapter 22, after Job responds and says, no, that's not right, Zophar, that's when the conversation gets a little heated. And Lyphaz gets a little irrational and I believe he almost loses his head. Now, the debate, if you read anything about Job, the debate that's occurring between Job and his friends is not like the political or the legal or the religious debates that happen on television today. There was a Republican debate last night, and I understand there's going to be one tonight. What their goal is, is to one-up the other candidates and to come out the victor on top. That's not the debate that took place back here in this time. The goal here of this debate is for Job and his friends not to win over the other people, but to come together and examine all the evidence and come up with the best possible answer of how Job can come out of what he was in. And Eliphaz understands the debate's not working properly. Job, you're not getting what we're saying. We're saying you're sinning. You're saying, no, that's not the case. They all tell Job that he sinned. You know what Job essentially says throughout this book? I'm just going to stay the course. Job's wife tells him, curse God and die, you've sinned. And Job says, hey, can't we receive bad things from the hand of God just as we receive good things? And he basically says, the Lord is almighty. His friend says, Job, you're a hypocrite. And Job comes back and tells him, you know, I know I'm going to discover deep things out of the darkness that I'm in. His friends question whether Job even knows God or not. And I love what Job responds with. He says, oh, how I wish my words were written with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever because I know that my Redeemer lives and that he will stand at the last day with me upon the earth. Job says, look, you guys can keep saying that. There's some times when you go through and you read, you'll go, Job's really close maybe to renouncing his religion and just fall in trap to what Satan wants him to do and just renounce God that, God is a just God and just accept God because God blesses him. But he doesn't do that. In chapter 22, Eliphaz is worked up and he cuts straight to the heart of the matter. Look in chapter 22 at the first couple of verses. Then Eliphaz, the Temanite, answered Job. And he, and he asked him five questions in rapid order. And he doesn't give Job a chance to respond. He says, Job, can a man be profitable unto God as, that, as he that is wise may be profitable unto himself? Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you're a righteous, Job, or is it gain to him that you make your ways perfect? Is not your wickedness great and your iniquities infinite? He's saying, what pleasure would it give God if you were righteous, Job? What would he gain if your ways were blameless? Job, you're a sinner and you're just swimming in your sins. Lyphaz basically portrays God as somebody who doesn't actively watch every move that Job makes. He portrays God as a God who is unaffected by what his people do. And he's saying that God is basically far removed from humanity. He's distanced and detached. He's removed from the earthly scene, and he's indifferent towards all people, including Job. Let me explain something to you. Life as his theology here when he's talking is no different than many of the world's religions. What life as is saying is God is not somebody who you can have a personal relationship with. Most of the world religions out there says that God can only be worshipped and he can't be known. The Islam and the Muslim faith is a faith that believes in a powerful but an unknowable God. Islam teaches that there is one supreme God who is worshipped through good deeds and disciplined religious rituals. But you can't have a personal relationship with him. Islam and Muslim says after death a person is rewarded or punished according to their religious devotion. Kind of sounds like what Eliphaz is saying. Hey, the reason you're being punished, Job, is because you did, some, you did some things that are in sin. You know what, Job? God doesn't care what you do individually. You just need to repent and turn back to Him. Did you know that out of the world's population, this, this staggered me. Only 6% of the 7 billion in the world are of the Protestant faith. <clears throat> That's Protestant, Methodist, Presbyterian. But 22% are of the Muslim faith. And most people will say, no, Morris, 32% are, Christi are Christianity uh, folks. But that includes Roman Catholics, Protestant, Orthodoxy, and Anglican. Those that believe like us is in a very much minority in the world today. Only 6% believe that Jesus Christ, you can have a personal relationship with him. Another world religion is deism. Deism holds that God does not intervene with the functioning of the natural world in any way. He created the earth, and then he backed up, and he's just letting the laws of nature take care of things. I read that Benjamin Franklin was a deist. 
Benjamin Franklin, Franklin wrote that he could, he could not reconcile that God who created the universe and controls all the planets and space in the universe would care to have a personal relationship with man. Hindus recognize the fact that there's many ways to salvation and there are diverse ways to salvation and that there's numerous gods to be worshipped and none of them you can know personally. Do you realize Christianity is basically the only religion that's out there that says I can have a personal relationship with the one who created me? The New Testament explains that I've got an intercessor that's in heaven right now. I've got a high priest that's talking to God in my behalf. All these others don't. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe Muslim. I believe Hindus. I believe Buddhism. I believe all those are world religions that Satan himself crafted. Because he knows if I can get folks to realize they can't have a personal relationship with Christ, Jesus, you're defeated. But you know what? He's already the victor. I'm already on that winning side. I believe that's what Job understood here when he was going through. Sure, Job got a little uh, wore out by these three fellows. And I believe Job sometimes stepped back and thought, I wonder that last business transaction I did, if I really cheated that person. I wonder if something I did in my past caused all this. But Job always circled back around and said, you know what? I recognize God's going to bring deep things out of this darkness that I'm in. I recognize that my Redeemer lives and He's going to stand with me in the last day. Job always circled back around. But Eliphaz is saying, Job, the supreme almighty God does not nor cannot have a close relationship with you. Can I just explain something to you tonight? Christ is knowable. John 17, verses 1 through 5, Jesus is speaking. He said, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, that they may know thee. You know, when me and Angie was dating, I kind of knew Angie, but I didn't know her until we really got married. When we got married, I learned there were some quirks that irritated her that I had. And there were some quirks that she had that irritated me that she had. Do you know what? The longer we are married, the more we fell in love. Kids say, oh, I'm in love today. You don't know what love is. Get married, figure out, yeah, figure out, yeah, you're really in love. Christ is knowable. And this is life eternal. Life eternal. That they might know thee, that they'll know you, God, the only true God, and they'll also know Jesus Christ, whom they'll sent. Christ is knowable. But also, Christ is approachable. Allah is not approachable. Buddha is not approachable. Confucius is not approachable. Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our emotions, but in all points was tempted like we are, yet with our sin. Then listen, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If Christ wasn't approachable, I couldn't go boldly to the throne of God. But you know what? Christ is approachable. Therefore, when I go to the throne of God, you know how I can go boldly to the throne of God? Because He's right there with me. When I go and pray, Jesus is praying. Morris explained that. I just did. When I pray, I believe Christ has taken my prayers, adding His prayers with them, and taking them on to God. And the Bible says the Spirit uh, makes intercession When all we do is groan. You ever been in a situation where you're hurting and you don't know what to pray? Holy Spirit already knows what you need to pray. Holy Spirit's taking that trueness from your heart and is taking it to Christ and then taking it on to God. No, Christ is knowable. Christ is approachable. And Christ knows us. Do you realize that? Listen, Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even the dividing sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. For the Word of God is quick and powerful. You know who the Word of God is? Who is it? It's Christ. The discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. No, Eliphaz was wrong. No, God can be known, God can be approached, and God knows us as an individual. See, I serve a Savior that walks with me every step of the way. What Eliphaz was trying to push was some impersonal religiosity. How would it be if we really served a God that we never could communicate with? How would it be if we said, you have a Savior, but He doesn't know how you really feel? When you go through these pains in life, when you go through these hurts, these heartaches, 
He don't know what you're going through. But no, I serve a Christ who is knowable, who is approachable, and who knows me as an individual. That's kind of scary that it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You ever had a thought or an intent that you go, I hope nobody else knows about that. God already knows what that we're thinking. He already knows the intent of what we're trying. There's many times I say when I'm working with somebody, if I can just know where they're coming from, I can deal with what they're wanting me to do. I don't always know that. But God, Christ, knows the intents of my heart before I ever get to that point in time. He knows my motivation for coming to church. He knows my motivation for giving to the church. He knows my motivation for helping other people. He knows my motivation when he sends somebody to me and I go, I don't have time to deal with you right now. He knows the thoughts and intents of my heart. No, Eliphaz has it wrong. Well, Eliphaz then, on in the, on in the chapter here, he gets personal with, with Job. Up to this point in time now, these three fellows have not pointed out specific sins. You know, as I go through up to chapter 22, I'm wanting to go, tell what Job did. You guys are saying that Job's wrapped up in sin. What specific sin did he do? Well, then Eliphaz starts off. Verse 6, he says, Job, you've taken a pledge from thy brother for naught and stripped the naked of, thy clo of their clothing. Job, you took people's clothing as deposits for, their lo for loans and you left them naked. See, the way I understand that this took place back then is whenever somebody came and made a surety for a loan, they would normally give their outer cloak. That outer cloak was their blanket. So when it got cold at night, what, this, what uh, Eliphaz is saying is, Job, you took their coat as a deposit and never gave it back to them when the night time came. Eliphaz doesn't know what he's talking about. Job deals with this later on. Then it says in verse 7, Thou hast not given water to the weary to drink, and thou hast withholden bread from the, from the hungry. Job, you denied water to the weary and food from the hungry. And then verse 8, But as for the mighty men, he had the earth, and the honorable man dwelled in it. He's saying that rich people grow arrogant and abuse their status as status a businessman. Getting real personal with Job. Then in verse number 9, he hits real low. He says, Job, you've sent widows away empty, and the arms of the fatherless have been broken. Job, you ain't even took care of the orphans and the widows. You ask me what sins you've committed, but none of these accusations are, are, are accurate. None of them are true. Then look what Eliphaz says in verses 10 and 11. He says, Therefore snares are round about thee, and sudden fear troubleth thee, or darkness that thou canst not see, and abundance of waters cover me. Job, you're in this mess because of the sins that you've committed. Then Eliphaz gets like many of the church wants to get. He becomes God's defense attorney. He begins to cross-examine Job, and look at what he says in verse 12. Is not God in the height of heaven? And behold the height of the stars, how high they are. And thou sayest, how doeth God know? Can he judge through the dark cloud? Thick clouds are a covering to him that he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. Hast thou marked the old way which wicked men have trodden, which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with the flood, which said unto God, Depart from us, and what can the Almighty do for them? Yet he filled their houses with good things, but the counsel of the wicked is far from me. The, the righteous see it and are glad, and the innocent laugh them to scorn. Whereas our substance is not cut down, but the remnant of them, the fire consumeth. Eliphaz probably got some amens from the crowd that was around them. But he's throwing theological darts to the wrong man. Job didn't sin. Then Eliphaz, in verse 21, offers Job an evangelistic invitation. He comes to the end of his sermon, and he says, Job, just acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace. Therefore good, good shall come unto thee, Receive, I pray thee, the law of his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. If thou return to the Almighty Job, thou shalt be built up, and thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Thou shalt lay up uh, gold as dust, and the gold of Ophar as the stones of the brooks. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. Sounds like some word of truth prosperity preachers to me. Some of these guys that's on television that says, if you'll just do this, God will bless your ministry. Boy, ain't that, or God will bless you materialistically. Ain't that uh, tempting sometimes? Hey, you send me $100 and God will give you 1000 Hey, Angie, how much we got in our checking account right now? But I got to come back. That ain't the way that God operates. Look at what he says in verse 26. For then thou shalt have delight in the Almighty and shall lift up thy face unto God. If you'll just turn to him, Job, everything's going to be great. Thou shalt make, a, make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. 
Eliphaz tells Job to repent of his sin and everything's going to turn out fine. Eliphaz believes that if a person is right with God, then all their problems vanish. Now listen, many Christians, and I'm sure many in here, you've experienced trials, but those trials didn't turn out the way you hoped they would turn out. Many of you have had things in your life you prayed for that didn't turn out the way you prayed for it. I have. I've even stepped back and said, God, I prayed to you. And I thought you said if I came to you that you wouldn't in no wise turn me away. These things that I've been coming to you, God, that I'm heavy hearted about, why didn't you answer them? Kind of felt like Job sometimes. I had a friend of mine, I never will forget, a neighbor of mine. He was my pastor. Got cancer when he was 44 years old. I turned 44 today. Thought many times about Greg. He was at a church that was growing. God struck him with cancer. Stepped back and we thought, we don't understand this. Why at this point in time? Somebody said, well, let's just pray for healing and God will heal him. Sounded good. Okay, God, we want you to heal him and we claim that in your name. Greg died, though. Horrible death. I step back afterwards and I'm going, I don't get this. I don't understand this, God. Here was a man that was living for you and doing the things that seemingly you tell us to do in your word, and then you just cut him down. You know what God taught me in all of that? Just what, just what, just hear me, I'm not trying to be super spiritual. God said, I don't owe you an explanation for anything I do. Nothing do I owe you an explanation for. But if you put your trust in me, just like Job, you'll recognize your Redeemer will stand at the end. You'll recognize that out of that darkness, you're going to learn some deep things. I believe that's what Job was learning. Now listen, yeah, if you come to Christ, I believe all your problems will be solved because I think that Christ will put your lives back together again. But coming to Christ does not guarantee a life without problems. In fact, I've resolved somebody comes to Christ... You're going to have a whole new set of problems that's going to come up on you. Wait a second, Morris, what might they be? You truly come to Christ, you may have to have a whole new set of friends. Your friends might disown you. You come to Christ and you'll start having some, what do I need to do then? I've got this road to take or that road to take, just like Job. But you come to Christ and what I can promise you is you can have that peace of God in your heart that the Holy Spirit can lead you and can guide you and when you don't know what to do, the Holy Spirit can guide you that you step back. I've done this in my life. I look back over my life and I go, boy, I see where God was with me here. (laughs) I see where he was with me there. I see where I wasn't with him here. And I thought that I was. Well, Job... In chapter 22, he's desperate, but in chapter 22, in 23, he is as well. Look in chapter 23. Uh, 34 times in the 17 verses, Job uses a personal pronoun identifying himself. He talks about me, I, me, I. I don't believe Job's being narcissistic. I don't believe that Job has a self-inflated view of himself. I believe as many times as Job's referring to himself, he's just being desperate. And verses 1 through 9 is a man who's searching his heart. Look at what Job says. Job's not really responding to Eliphaz. He's just talking right now. Then, then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke or God's hand is, heavy, is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my, my cause before him. I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Will he plead with me? Would he oppose me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with, with him so that I be delivered forever from my judge. It's like Job is getting angry and the longer he talks, the matter he gets. And then look in verse 8, he's a man in desperation. He says, behold, I go forward and he's not there and I go backward and I can't perceive him. On the left hand where he doeth work, I can't behold him and he hideth himself from the right hand that I can't see him. You talk about desperation. I'm praying and God's not hearing me. I want to talk to him and God's nowhere around. Job's conversation is not a rebuttal of a life as his argument. Rather, Job is expressing his longing for fellowship with God. Now listen, prior to the invention of a compass, navigation required a person to navigate by the landmarks or by the stars to get where they was going. 
And that was okay until a landmark changed and you couldn't see the stars, it was cloudy. But when a compass was invented, a magnetic compass, it changed the way navigation took place. They got out and the landmark wasn't there. The stars couldn't be seen. They got the compass out. They pulled it out. It automatically pointed north. They knew where they needed to go. Well, Job has got a spiritual compass that whenever he starts to get, he don't know where to go. The landmark has changed. I can't see the stars. Job's spiritual compass always points to God. When he gets in such despair numerous times in the course of the book, Job always seems to find his way back to who God truly is. Just when you think Job is lost, Job's spiritual compass points to God. Job's in desperation, but look in verse 10. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Gold is purified through a process of high temperature heating or through chemical exposure. Job knows that he's been placed in a furnace. Job knows that the heat has been turned up. Look at what he says, though. People want to claim that verse, but look what Job throws in the mix in verse 11 and 12, some personal responsibility. Job says, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. He's saying, you know what? God's word is more necessary than the food that I, I eat. We went at my aunt's house this afternoon and had a, a great lunch. And I was a little hungry when I sat down there. It was uh, almost to the point of being famished. I was, I was ready to eat. Do you know what Job is saying? God's words, him speaking to me, is more nourishment than that food that I eat. And he says, I've continued to do those things that he's asked me to do. You, and, you get in a funk in your life spiritually. I do sometimes. You know what we're called to do? We're called to just continue to pray and read and come to church and do those things in ministry God's called us to do. What God wants us to do is be faithful to him. He's always faithful to us. He's never unfaithful to us. He says, just continue to be obedient to what I tell you to do. Now listen, I've been exposed to Christ just like that chemical exposure to gold purifies gold, I've been exposed to, exposed to Christ who's, who's purified me. So I've been made gold in that relationship with him, but he still allows me to be placed in the heat to be refined. And he works on me, and he works on me, and he makes me the way he wants me to be. Before a person comes to Christ, they're like that navigator who's relying on the landmarks and the stars. As long as the landmarks don't move and you can see the stars, you can keep moving. But when the storms come your way, you can't see the landmarks and you can't see the stars. And change happens in your life. My question is, what are you using to guide you then? Salvation is a compass for life. When I came to Christ, he put inside of me that automatic compass. It points to him whenever darkness comes. And when I continue to point to him... He continues to put me in that fire to refine and to make me what he wants me to be. And when I was studying this, there was a little song that kids used to sing. And it used to be pretty popular. I remember growing up, we'd sing it at Pleasant View. And it's something like this. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me. There really ought to be a sign up on my heart. Don't judge me yet, there's an unfinished part. But I'll be perfect just according to his plan, fashioned by the master's loving hand. And in the mirror of his word, reflections that I see, makes me wonder why he never gave up on me. But he loves me as I am, and he helps me when I pray. Remember, he's the potter, I'm the clay. When Job says in verse number 10, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My question to you tonight, is your life worth your weight in gold? If, you're, if your life is hid in Christ, you've been made gold. But you know what? He still puts you in that fire, in that furnace, cuts the heat up occasionally. Maybe make it a little uncomfortable for you. Maybe pushes you and just gets you to where... He wants you to be, 
And you know what I love about this? All the other religions that's out there says you're born into it. All these types of things. It's a personal choice that you make whether you serve Christ or not. Nobody that ever stands before Christ that he says enter in is ever going to be forced into heaven. That's a problem I got with Calvinists. They say you're either predestined for heaven or you're predestined for hell. Best I understand, my Bible tells me whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you ever called upon his name? If you have, you're worth your weight in gold. Your weight in gold. Still working on you. If you've never accepted him as your Savior, though, tonight is the night that he can take and expose you to him. You say, wait a second, Morris. You make Christianity and salvation have to be something. I'm going to have problems afterwards. Well, let me just explain this to you. The benefits far outweigh the pains. You understand what I'm saying? The benefits of knowing him far outweighs. Why? Because the peace of God passes all understanding. Do you know him tonight? If you don't, tonight is the night he brought you in to hear he loves you. And it may be you do know him, but you step back and say, you know what? I'm just not living my life in accordance with what he wants, and I believe he's got a plan for everybody's life. Everybody has a plan for their life that he's already got laid out. I look at it this way, and I've told the teenagers at 180, I believe God's got a vast library. It's got my name on a book. He says, Morris, that's your plan for your life. I've done got it written. I've done got it laid out. But it's your choice whether you allow me to exercise that in your life or not in your life. Are you allowing him to exercise that in your life? He loves you as an individual. He just wants you to come to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to stand and how I praise you for the book of Job. Lord, I thank you that it's a book that shows us that regardless of what takes place in our life and what heartaches and what bad times and what good times as well, all that comes from you, you allow that to happen. But just like Job taught us, in the midst of all that, we know that our Redeemer lives. In the midst of all that, we know that you're going to make us pure gold. In the midst of all that, I know that you're in heaven making intercession for me right now. Somebody here doesn't know you as our Savior. I, I pray, and I know that the Holy Spirit's dealing with the heart right now, that this would be that night they would come to you as, a, as, for, as their Savior and Lord, and they would leave out of here a brand new individual. Father, I love you for who that you are, and I thank you that you're faithful to me, even in the many times I'm unfaithful to you. You just meet with us. You, do a, you, do, you, you meet needs wherever the needs are tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.